All right, I see it's 2.15. So I'm just gonna go ahead and welcome everyone to this panel. My name is Melissa. I am your moderator this afternoon for the panel, How Can Theory Help Us Be Better Librarians? So we have three uh, panelists today. We have Logan Rath from SUNY Brockport. He's a research and instruction librarian. Carol Ann Germain, who's a librarian and associate teaching faculty at SUNY Albany. And Amy Van Scoy, who's at the University at Buffalo as an associate professor. So before we get started, I just wanted to remind people to please remain muted, but to please feel free to post questions in the chat, which we will all be monitoring. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Logan, Carol Ann, and Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be running the slideshow today. Uh, I didn't put my credentials there. I'm almost, uh, I, I technically finished everything to start my dissertation, and I'm working on that right now. Um, but in addition to being a librarian, I'm a doc student at University of Buffalo in their brand new information science program. So first, a poll, because active learning, right? And I, I want to learn some things. So I'm going to actually paste the link in the chat, but we're going to head over and do a Mentimeter. And so, yes, there we go. And copy this link, paste it over here. So you should be able to click on that. And so this is, I just want to get your feelings. We want to know, uh, there's a lot that the literature says about practitioners and theory and researchers. So I just sort of want to see where on the pain scale you fit. Nice, we've got no one in the crying camp so far. <laughs> and several people over on the, the happy side of things and the very happy side. And I'm not surprised given the fact that it's a session about theory that those who are drawn to theory and talking about theory would show up. Okay, well, I'm just gonna take it as a win that there's no one over in crying land. Okay, so the next question I have is, what word comes to mind when you hear the word theory? And hopefully this is gonna create a nice pretty word cloud. Ugh. I like that's the first one that came up. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> is that the crying one <laughs> maybe maybe this word cloud's not actually too bad mm -mm. for how this generates you need to capture the word cloud logan so we can have it for later okay Oh no, Raquel, I didn't do my job if you said ugh. <laughs> okay, so we have 43 participants of, uh, and I will just, if those who joined later wanted to participate, I'm just going to paste that again. If anyone else would like to hop in and just let us know what comes to mind when you hear the word theory. I like the words that everyone came up with. I do think it's funny that uh is coming up. It's not surprising um, to see uh come up and we're gonna talk about that in a very brief presentation before we jump into questions to sort of situate things. And for me to use what I've already written in my introduction to my dissertation. So, okay, we'll pop back after and check back in on that. So theory to practice gap in library and information studies, library and information science, LIS. So we have several researchers saying practitioners don't often use theory in their work, um, at least when they publish or present. And I did a quick little skim of the conference program here 
to see about citations in abstracts and descriptions. And we are the only session that has a citation in our abstract. Uh, so that seems to follow the course. But it's interesting when you start to look at why. And a lot of times practitioners don't find theory relevant to their work. Uh, and that's a big issue out there, right? You've got practitioners that say, yeah, you wrote this thing, but how do I use this? I, I don't want to do that thinking. I want the researcher who's doing the work with the theory to let me know the implications and to talk about how I can use that in my practice. And then because it's LIS and bibliographies are something that we study, uh, researchers don't publish in practitioner journals. Now that's a sweeping generalization, right? But uh, some do, many don't. Uh, and so this is a table that I just lifted out of the literature. It it's comes from fall or hall 2019. Um, and he lists some problems that go along. So the authors of reports of academic research appear unaware of the priorities and job demands of practitioners. And I say, I've noticed that when I'm reading. It's like, this is great that this exists, but now I have to take what you're doing and use it? Okay. Uh, the means by which researchers disseminate their research are ineffective. And that's that whole, there, there seem to be two separate camps of publications going on really. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read like information research. Like you just go there and read it for fun when you're sitting at the reference desk. I know it's not something I do um, outside of when I'm doing doctoral work. And then there are a bunch of sources at the bottom of this. This is mainly a slide again for everyone to look at later. So let's check back in. Okay. Bloated, these are smaller words. Uh, deep thoughts, Marx comes to mind. So a specific theory, study, trial, the big words being guide, research, foundation, structure, philosophy, um, critical. I think a lot of people know about critical theory, especially since there was a, a workshop this morning on it. So that may be fresh in people's minds. Great. Okay, so we're going to jump right into the panel uh, and we're going to take turns. Uh, Caroline or Amy, who wants to start? With tell us your theory journey, where did you start and where are you now? I'll let Amy go first. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I am now uh, on the faculty at the information science program at UB. But before that, I was a librarian. I did um, reference and instruction at North Carolina State University Libraries in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, I didn't worry much about theory uh, in the first you know, five or so years that I was a librarian. But um, there came a point where um, I started to get frustrated. And this is probably when I became a manager and I was doing more training um, and more like problem solving for the whole department. Um, and I got really frustrated that there were no um, guidelines or structures to help me solve my problems. And I had been um, really using the um, uh, steps of the reference interview and the, you know, RUSA guidelines for behavioral performance as a structure for doing reference and um, for helping to um, like professional development to improve, improve my reference service and for training graduate students, you know, that was a useful tool to give them. Um, but I was like, why aren't there more things like the steps of the reference interview that I can, um, you, you know, use to apply to new problems that I didn't learn about in library school. And I actually, this was actually kind of irritating to me. So that's probably what uh, incentivized me to go on and do research and to study librarians' um, personal practical theories. And, and Dana has mentioned in the chat that idea that librarians have these theories, but they don't really uh, realize it or think about them as theories, uh, but they're called practice theories. And, and that's something that I uh, was really interested, am, am really interested in studying. Um, and I'm also really interested in helping um, uh, practicing librarians to see that um, point, the point of theory, how it can be useful. And um, so I'm doing that in a little bit of my work, but I think as Logan said, um, 
that that's something uh, that can, that's more useful if somebody can like do the work for you to show you how you can use that in practice because when you're rushed and just moving from one thing to another and librarians are always busy with things, um, you don't really have time to sit down, read about the theory and think about it necessarily. Um, and I also use it in my teaching. So I'm trying to um, help my students see that this is something valuable and really applicable to practice. And it's not just something um, up there and lofty and school and some of those words that you all were using. Um, so I think that would be uh, sort of my story and why I really wanted to be a part of this panel. So most of you have some idea of who I am, um, and most of you would think that uh, if you were thinking of a word, uh, you know, practice and practical are, are really a words that I, um, I follow, uh, but theory is also a part of what I do. Um, I've been a librarian for almost a quarter of a century, um, and I am currently now a faculty member in uh, the information library science program at the university. So I am teaching graduate students as well as undergraduate students. But a lot of my theory really started in graduate school in, in, in my gaining knowledge of it, but it really came into um, practice with what I was doing in, in the libraries and in teaching. Um, and so in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, we, you know, ramped up a an information literacy program where we were teaching credit courses. And even though that I had gone and, and read uh, theory, um, and it's not, some of your words were dry, nerdy, ugh, um, you know, those, you know, when, when you're not putting it into practice, sometimes that's the, where theory, you know, that's kind of how you put it in context because you, you're not putting it in, in practice in many ways. Um, but it really, what we found was that as we were going into to being instructors and teachers, uh, which um, Logan would say, yeah, librarians are teachers. Uh, we realized that, you know, we had to go back and look at that theory and, and looking at how we, taught students and, and looking at how, you know, they relate to information. And certainly we, we pulled in a uh, cool towel as far as, you know, the, the idea of library anxiety that comes not only in instruction, but it comes in, in reference um, and realizing at what stage students are at, what they're thinking, what they're experiencing. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we go back to theory when we have a problem or an issue. And yes, theory is abstract, but it really a lot of times helps us guide what we put into practice. And so that, that can be extremely helpful. Um, so that's, that's really my journey, my story. I continue to use it now that I am I'm doing more as far as teaching librarians or people who are going to be librarians, how they're going to use that theory when they're sitting at, the, at a reference desk or where, where you know, we have, you know, theory is going to be for us extremely important as we start to evolve into different formats of how we access and present information, in particular, the use of technology and some of the issues that, that arise from that. And so theory is of, of value in that. Thank you. Uh, I'll jump in and share. My journey to theory is different than both of uh, my other panelists. I was an education major as an undergrad. And so I went through this undergraduate program where you learn theories and you learn how to play them out. And you do student teaching and it's based on constructivism and social constructivism. And then I started over in the library world and I, I sort of looked around and went, where where are the theories? What, what are we doing? We're, we're we're just sort of shoved into a classroom without a whole lot of training on how to teach. You know, we we don't think about that kind of stuff. We just think about getting through to students, right? And we have to help the students, and we're going to do it the best way we know how. Um, but I fortunately had all of this theoretical groundwork to rely on for my education courses. Uh, things like bringing in active learning and group work and how all that works together. The idea of multiple intelligences, even though that's been highly debated. Uh, so to take that sort of stuff, and as I just saw Carrie put in the chat, my instruction class in library school was seriously lacking. Uh, 
So yeah, that's very common in the literature. Everything you'll read says that there's not enough. And I personally have an idea that the, the field needs to reckon with if it's important to take an extra cataloging class or take more instruction class. Or maybe they need to agree that 36 credits are not enough credits to actually do what you need to do. Um, but I started with those theories and then in library land, working in library land, I started going, this is interesting, I wanna do more. I knew I needed to get promoted and get tenure. So I started doing a second master's degree in information design and technology. And then I jumped over to a PhD after, uh, mostly because for those of us in state funded institutions, the union pays for 90% of it. And so I wanted to use that benefit. Uh, and then I started diving into literacy as a whole, as my field. So I'm actually not enrolled in the information science program, even though those are my people and those are the cohort I hang out with. I'm in the, uh, the curriculum instruction and the science of learning. Uh, yeah, so anyone who is part of U, uh, UUP, you get a tuition benefit of one class a semester. They don't pay fees. Um, it's not the individual development awards, it's the UUP waiver. It is a full tuition waiver. There are no tax benefits um, or challenges. You just pay the fees and you're done. Uh, and so I do have to pay for my dissertation. I will say that they don't cover that. But I started taking literacy classes because I started noticing being a librarian for education that I was seeing a lot happening in those education courses. And they were talking about what they call text in the same ways that we talk about information, uh, meaning that text can be format agnostic. Uh, I was reading about the history of library instruction and I came across someone who said that we can read the way a bird flies in the 1950s. Uh, and we can read how animal, animals interact. So I started to really fall in love with literacy and those theories of, and then looking at information literacy and going, okay, there's a theory practice gap in information science, but there's also this like silo, they're almost metal silos. They're, you know, they're, they're steel, we'll say, where the literacy people and the information literacy people don't look at each other. Few exceptions. Um, and I'll talk about that later. So question two, which theories do you find yourself turning to in your research or practice? Give a brief explanation of the theory. Carol, would you like to go first on this one? Sure. So uh, Kultal is, is somebody, and I'm sure you've all encountered Kultal. Um, and, and Kultal really, when we're thinking about it, I mentioned it a few minutes ago, is the idea of human feelings, thoughts. And so there are different stages, the idea of, you know, you have this information need, task. Um, you know, a lot of times students, and I'm sure you realize, to have a hard time selecting a topic. How do we get their heads around it? idea of exploring, okay? Um, how are you going to, to follow through on it? Um, and then, you know, this whole process, the stages of going and, and getting information, and then basically the, the idea of the, the search closure, what, what, you know, that you've gotten the information you need. And so here's a place where whether you are in reference or whether you are um, in instruction, these are going to be, these are really, really um, important. And I, and I go through these uh, because we, we, we encounter um, students, we encounter faculty sometimes who really have um, emotional concerns. Sometimes this is linked to um, information anxiety. Okay. Uh, the idea, uh, especially nowadays that we have so much available to us, you know, you go and you do a Google search, you go out, you can find information in lots of ways, but looking at it and, and now they're really nervous about coming and asking a question because they feel a, like, you know, they're a failure. Um, and so Kintown really kind of helps us get our heads around the idea of that, that there are these frustrations and anxieties. And if you can realize this, okay, um, then you can be, do I want to say empathetic 
um, in your practice uh, in order to really provide the best for the patron. And sometimes this provides a level of, of reading the patron as well. Okay. So um, I put a link in the chat because I wasn't sure if the theories we were talking about were going to be things that, that resonated with you all. Um, oh, oh, thanks. I, I hadn't thought about about showing everybody as we do it. So yeah, there's Colthal's information search process model, which I also was gonna pick as one of those go-to theories that I think are important. Um, my background is reference and instruction and that's still what I'm interested in. So, so again, I have the same, the same kind of approach. Um, but the second one doesn't get as much um, uh, attention in reference. And I think it's a really super useful model for the same way that the information search process model kind of, you know, can help you to communicate with students about what they're going through. Like I actually use it all the time with my students in classes. I'll say, so how are you feeling about your paper? And they're all glum and they say, um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not feeling too good about it. I was really excited about it before and I'm not. And then I hold up that Colthouse information search process model. And I say, well, see, you're right here in the model and you're supposed to be feeling uncertain and, and they all relax a little bit. So, you know, that's just such a useful model in so many contexts. But this other one, this content relational model, um, this is a model developed from practice. So this is not, um, you know, this is not uh, a, a scholar in the ivory tower telling librarians what they should do. This is a, a scholar who, some of you might know Marie Bradford. Um, you know, she studied what, uh, what librarians were doing with users in virtual reference encounters. And that's how she came up with this model. And um, so the idea is that the content of the reference interaction is important, but also the interpersonal um, uh, aspect is important. So the librarian may, um, you know, give the perfect answer or, or share the perfect source, but if they don't make a connection with the user, um, either get the user's trust or make the user feel that they care about them or that they're engaged in the interaction in some way, then the user may still feel like this is a completely unsuccessful encounter. Um, Librarians on the other hand feel if they can't answer the question, but they've made a connection with the user and all that interpersonal stuff is great, um, but they can't answer the question, librarians think it was unsuccessful. Users don't feel the same way, but, but that explains sometimes why we feel so awful when the answer, when we can't provide an answer. Um, but uh, but a, a successful encounter for both the librarian and the user is um, if both of these um, aspects are addressed. And I think this is just really um, useful in thinking about your own uh, reference work. Like, are you providing, you know, enough content, but are you also addressing that interpersonal um, relationship aspect? Um, it also helps to understand, like, what's valuable to the user. Like, if, if you don't build trust, uh, or if you built the trust, but you still didn't answer the question, like that's still a success for you in the library. So you can feel a little bit better about that, that sort of aspect. Um, and I can really see how this would be useful in training. I think I used it a bit in training, but it was, it was kind of new um, when I was uh, just leaving my um, practice. Um, but helping your, uh, you know, graduate students or your undergrads or helping out on the reference desk, um, or maybe new staff um, at the library, to help them understand what's important in that one on one interaction that it's not just answering the question, but also developing this relationship. So th this model, I think is really easy to see how you could use it for improvement of your own work for um, uh, for training, but also for um, articulating what it is that you're doing at the service point. So if somebody makes a crack about what do we need librarians for, there's Google. And you can say, well, Google can do the content part, but can they do the relational part? You know, maybe not. So um, I would say this is probably my uh, most uh, useful, but most underused uh, reference model. And I do have reference at the bottom for the book that uh, Marie Radford put out fairly recently a couple years ago called Library Conversations, where she really provides a lot of examples and gives a lot of credibility to the to the model. Thank you. Uh, I did not think to search for graphics. We'll have to add these in afterwards uh, before we post the presentation. 
Uh, so the theories that I draw on, uh, one of the theories that I use all the time is motivation, self-determination theory by Ryan and Desi. Uh, and that says basically that motivation is a continuum from extrinsic motivation all the way to internal or intrinsic motivation. And if someone is extrinsically motivated, that's those of us who go to work because we need a paycheck, right? That's extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is me getting a doctorate because I want to learn more about it, even though it's not going to help me in my current role. Uh, and I think about where students fall on that line when they come to the reference desk. You know, they are mostly extrinsically motivated by the fact that they have to get a grade on this paper. And so they need what they need to get through. Another theory that I use very often, I'd say it's more of a theoretical framework and it does build on um, Mellon's library anxiety. There's this article in 2018 by McAfee on shame and the role that shame plays in the library. And that has been one of my driving theories that I bring with me. And it's this idea that patrons and faculty feel like they should know how to do all of this by the time they get to college. We know that's just not true, right? But students don't, faculty don't. Uh, when they started our libraries, they know how to use their doctoral, their R1 library, uh, and they knew how to get what they needed to get by, but they're afraid to look foolish. And so they don't ask questions. And so mitigating that shame uh, is a, yes, when I'm not talking, I will paste it in. Sorry, I saw the chat come up about sharing the article. Uh, it, it's very, it's helpful for me. Another one that I bring with me is uh, information landscapes um, and literacies of information. It's by Anne-Marie Lloyd. Uh, I did a pilot study, I guess we'll call it for the dissertation. It was way more than a pilot study. Uh, and I conducted 17 interviews of librarians and 87 survey results. And no one knew who Anne-Marie Lloyd was. Uh, which was very telling. So she's a younger scholar. Uh, I think she got her PhD in 2005. Uh, and she looks at information literacy outside of higher ed. Uh, she looks at information literacy of firefighters, enthusiast car restorers. Um, and it's this idea of her theory that she came up with is this concept of information landscapes uh, that every information encounter is sort of its own unique landscape. And there are features that are similar across landscapes, but they may be ordered slightly differently. And this explains perfectly to me why when I get my student as a junior in their education courses, they didn't transfer what they learned in English 101 into this scenario. They understand, here's the box, I type the keywords in, I get the articles. But they don't understand that those keywords are really the language of a community of scholars. And that's the other piece Information Landscapes brings in, is that these discourses and these landscapes are socially shaped, so by people. And that is the, the too long tweet version of those theories. So our next question, nope. Tell us about the time you applied a specific theory in the context of librarianship. How did you do it and what did you learn from it? Logan, do you wanna go first with one of these or shall, sure. I, shall I go back so, to me? Okay. Yeah, so one of the theories that I brought in for design and instruction is the idea of a dual coding theory um, and that comes from literacy. And that basically means that your images and your text have to tell the same story. If your images and text don't reinforce each other, we won't, uh, comprehension is hindered. And, and so I bring that in when I decide which graphics I'm going to use when I'm working with someone, when I'm designing a libguide, 
I don't put a random photo on the front page of my guides that's completely unrelated to what my guide is about because it doesn't make sense. Um, it was a fad that went around and we tried it in our library and we actually shifted away from it. Um, but that's one of the, the theories. And I learned that it really did make students take better advantage of the guides. Yeah, I will uh, address um, Holly's question in the chat. She asks how we're defining theory. And that, that is a really uh, good question. And uh, for something like um, discussion of the theory practice gap, I tend not to worry too much about um, the, you know, scholarly um, arguments about different levels of theory. Um, you know, some people say that it, that it has to be really predictive. Some people say um, sort of view a model or something that organizes the world into being theory. Um, and, and for me, it's just any kind of tool that helps you abstract the messiness of your environment and, um, and explain that in some, in some way. So um, yeah, some of these things that, um, like I'm gonna talk about a, a serious leisure perspective here for the next question. Um, and, and I guess that's not really a theory, I guess that's a framework, but, um, but for me, the, the point is um, using theories, models, frameworks, lenses to help you see uh, your environment in a way that um, can help you solve problems and make sense of things. So that's really the way I'm defining theory, but it is a good point, Holly, we probably should have um, explained that at, at the beginning because there are lots of different ways to, to talk about theory. So my, my time yeah. um, uh, that I'm gonna apply theory is um, uh, I worked with Jenna Hartel and Leslie Thompson to apply the serious leisure perspective to public library programming. And um, this chart, thank you, Logan, um, shows how um, Stebbins uh, classified um, different types of leisure. So he, um, uh, this is from the area of leisure studies and and he said there was sort of this casual leisure like playing or just watching a movie. And then there's serious leisure. And that is, you know, we all either are or know someone who is um, like an expert in something, but it's not the job they do. So it might be like somebody who's just an expert genealogist, but really in real life, they're an accountant or whatever. Um, and then there's project-based leisure also, which might be like crafts that you make at Christmas or something like that. Um, so this is a pretty well-developed um, way of, of conceptualizing leisure. And uh, Jenna Hartel has done a lot of work to apply it to information science. But um, the three of us wanted to apply it to um, uh, public library programming for a couple of reasons. At first, um, public libraries, and I'm sorry, I'm talking about public libraries, but I think in the back of your mind, you can think about like all the leisure related things that you do in academic libraries as well. Um, uh, public libraries are really trying to position themselves as a place where lifelong learning occurs, but we all think of a public library as also a place for our leisure pursuits. And, um, but that's not something public libraries talk about a lot because, uh, you know, maybe it's not as useful. They're not gonna get as much money for saying, well, we're helping people to have be a better leisure lives. Um, so partly we wanted to say, no, this is legitimate. Leisure is legitimate. It has theory. Um, and this is something that libraries can talk about and be proud of and um, articulate to their communities. Um, but also there's not formal theory for programming. So um, public librarians tend to rely on like their own interests or, um, uh, community interest in a particular topic when they're um, deciding which programs they wanna put on. So we thought that the serious leisure perspective would be a way for analyzing what programs these libraries were offering and also maybe show gaps and uh, areas where there were a, a lot of programs. So uh, these were the results we studied uh, for public libraries in um, Canada and the US and one in New York. Um, <laughs> And um, as you can see from the little numbers on certain boxes that there are certain um, types of leisure uh, that uh, were really well addressed, like under um, uh, the casual leisure, 
there were 77 that were active entertainment as opposed to none that were play. And, and maybe that makes sense. Maybe play is not something a public library really needs to have a program about. Um, but um, let's see, when we go over to uh, the project-based leisure, like these one shot or these making and tinkering projects, which is the second one down under one shot projects. Um, there was a whole lot of like knitting and crocheting um, kind of programs. And those are probably really easy to put on and super interesting. Like I'm psyched about Danielle teaching me how to crochet uh, later on today. Um, so I think that those are important programs, but um, if you look under say arts projects, there was only one arts-based one-shot project. And you think, well, there's a lot of ways that, that librarians could bring more art into the library. Maybe that's not necessary. So it's still up to the librarian to decide with their community, um, which kinds of entertaining, which kinds of leisure activities do they wanna target? But uh, this kind of, this could help a, a library say, well, gosh, we have loads of making and tinkering, but not a whole lot of arts or not a whole lot of science. And so that could open up ideas um, and also have kind of a theoretical basis for this, that you're not just saying, um, it's like, a, a, and not just saying like, oh, we need more science programs, but rather science is an aspect of serious leisure and we don't have anything in science. So maybe we should um, you know, do a program to meet the needs of these folks that we haven't heard from. So what we learned was, um, yes, we could analyze uh, leisure programs based on this framework and that we could see that some areas are um, really well covered and other areas there are gaps. So our next phase with this project is to maybe build it out and find a way uh, to help librarians actually use this and analyze their own programs uh, some way that would be really uh, fairly easy to analyze and then you know, print up a report or something like that that would help them justify um, the time they need or the funds they need to develop these programs for their users. And the citation to that paper, if you're interested in reading, is on that page too. So one of the theories that I have used in librarianship in particular um, with instruction is Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and the idea of um, looking at what students know, how they build, how you scaffold up their learning. And so uh, one of the things we, we did uh, do the uh, information literacy course, which we put a lot of that theory into. Um, and as time went on, I created a course which we called digital professionalism. So this course was um, less of your uh, basic information literacy, but more in the, um, the idea it was for uh, juniors and seniors and some uh, late semester sophomores. Um, it was a credit course. It was only a one credit course. But the idea of by that time they would have selected a major. They have an idea of you know, what their direction is going to be. But with Bloom's taxonomy, you're looking at what their knowledge is, you're looking at how you're going to build that, how you're going, you know, their understanding of, of a concept. And so while I don't bring that, you know, to them, I integrate that, that idea into, into the course. So starting out at the beginning, you know, what knowledge do they have in a specific area? Um, luckily, I, I was able to break them up into groups. It was not team-based learning, but they were in groups by what, um, what major they were going to be in or a close major. So um, uh, they would be able to work together in those groups when they were in class. And so we would start with things that were, what was their understanding of the discipline that they were in, um, and what some of the concepts that they had in that discipline, learning from that. Um, we went into things along the lines of specific subject dictionaries, which most students had no idea were out there. Um, and their understanding of, you know, there's a specific vocabulary that they need to uh, integrate. And, and again, scaffolding off of a very basic and moving up um, into, um, you know, in, into the discipline. Uh, then we went in looking at different uh, tools that they would use, such as the idea of a conversation within the literature, the idea that they would be looking in their specific um, 
area of their, their major. Um, and, and then using that, okay, um, to learn more about it. They also had to uh, look up an association and actually do an informational interview with somebody that was in the field. So then they were, they were applying, uh, you know, some of the knowledge that they had, they, ha you know, they had to write a, an email. And that's where we get more into the idea of the di digital professionalism that they would, they would have that knowledge of digital resources in addition to, um, you know, how, and again, ramping it up um, and applying it uh, and actually using it. Um, then they, they actually interviewed those people, uh, which is a little outside of what we would consider information literacy, but the idea of, again, applying it, talking with somebody in the field was really, really helpful. Um, they had to um, actually create a, uh, an elevator you know, speech about who they were, um, and then they had in, in the analysis of this, of, of reviewing what they did and um, looking at, you know, the, using the theory and, and not telling them that it was the theory, um, you know, of, of where they stood um, in, in that particular area and, their, and what decisions they made. Um, and their, their end product, um, they had multiple choice, you know, multiple options on that. Um, but they had to create a product using what they had learned um, and then evaluating that at the end. Okay, I'm being conscious of the time. So we'll spend just a minute or so each talking about a theory that we least enjoy using and why. Um, generally, everyone that I've asked this question to has one and it's usually tied to some tra traumatic experience. Uh, who would like to start? I'm gonna let Amy start. I don't really. I... <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I don't have any theory trauma to um, discuss. I mean, may, you know, I, I really couldn't think of anything, but um, I, I guess I have to say that the one type of theory that I don't really care for are those like flow chart process models that just go through like the steps that a student does. Um, you know, because they, they might be good for like Alexa, like if she doesn't know how to answer a reference question, like she might, that might be helpful to her. But, um, you know, for me, I like theories that where, somehow they help me make sense of the messiness of, of my environment. So like Cole Thau's model, this helps you make sense of the emotional aspects of reference. And, um, uh, you know, the content relational model says something about why you might feel that an interaction went well when in fact the student doesn't seem satisfied, you know? So if it makes sense, helps me to make sense of the mess and, you know, like hundreds of, um, library programs, like, what do you do with that? How do you decide if that's good or bad? Well, you know, the serious leisure perspective allowed us to at least count them up and put them in categories and that told us something. So that's, I, I guess I would say like those flow charts that, you know, that you learn about in library school and then, you know, never think about again, like those are maybe the least, but it's not, it's not particular theory. So that's my best answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't have any, any that really chafe me, yeah. Right. I'll jump in and just come out. I, I hate working with activity theory. I, I absolutely <laughs> detest it. Um, now the evolution of activity. So activity theory looks at why activities happen within a system. Um, I think that's the, the very light uh, definition of it. And it's not about the people at all. Like the unit that you measure things by is an activity and it's not the person doing the activity and it's not the whole group. It's just, it's very 1960s Soviet. Uh, that, that's what comes to mind when I read it. It's just not the culture that I'm used to growing up in. And, and that's important when we look at theories too, right? Is thinking about the people behind it and how their upbringing and their interaction with the world around them help them develop their theory. Uh, I will say I am loving practice theory, um, and Shotsky is the guy there, where we talk about how practices are developed by people, and it, it, there's really a shift in focus to people that go with that one. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. And so we can transition into Q&A right after this. 
Um, but what advice do you have for the audience when it comes to using theory in their work? I think certainly Amy and Logan are much better at explaining theory than I am. Uh, but one of the things, you know, in reading it and putting it into, in, I tend to put it more into practice than anything, but gain some understanding from it. But I think in this presentation, there are uh, certainly theories. There's this iceberg theory of writing from Hemingway and the idea of less is more. Um, and this kind of, there's a, a follow up on that of iceberg theory of presentation, you know, the idea of using one slide, one idea, making it simple. Logan kind of referred to that uh, earlier. Um, I think it's integrating the theory into your practice. So I, I kind of think that um, while the literature says, yes, we're not using theory, I think we are, but I think we've, in many many cases have become pretty um, well versed in it in order to integrate it into our work. Yeah, I guess my advice is mostly for the folks who said theory was sort of lofty and brainy or the folks who said meh. And, and I guess I'd like the advice is just to see theory as this lens for making sense of your environment and not it shouldn't be telling you what to do and not all theories are gonna be helpful to you, but you have to like try on different lenses like sunglasses, you know, and you know, this sunglasses might be too dark for this situation, but these, you know, lighter ones might work better. Um, and they, when you put on these lenses, sometimes they can help you come up with new ideas to solve your problems. They can make you see your problem in another way and um, or they could make help you argue. I mean, they could help you argue for the your value, for the value of a service, for money that you need. They could help you explain things like to trainees or, um, uh, you know, so I just, I just see theory as this tool that helps you make sense and, and solve problems and is useful in your work, not like something you have to learn and do. It's, it's, it's a tool for you, just like any other kind of um, reference tool you might purchase, like reference software or something like that. It's just another tool. Okay. Um, I'm going to show this little Bronco guy off for <laughs> anyone who's playing any of the home games. Uh, so my advice is it's okay to hate it. You know, it, it, this is like what Amy said with the sunglasses. Sometimes you put sunglasses on and they don't fit you, right? You don't have to love every theory. Uh, and talk with people about them because that's where the understanding really um, comes in is until you start looking at that whole conversation. So talk with your colleagues about it. Start a reading group. Look at who cited the theory and maybe start there like a level removed where someone else has had to do that distilling work to sort of make it relevant in a context. Uh, and reach out, use the SUNY Law Listserv and say, hey, I'm looking at this. Does anybody want to partner? We did start, uh, there is a, a forum in the community hub if you're looking for collaborations. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. Uh, and then Holly asked, is anyone looking at bias in our professional theories? It's starting. I, I will say it's starting. So I attend um, the ACIST and the ELISE conferences. Uh, those are two that I found that when I need to start moving a little more into theory, um, the Association for Information Science and Technology, uh, I left it the first S out, but, um, and then the Association of Library and Information Science Educators. So uh, starting to look at some of those presentations, they are really, there's this shift towards criticality and sort of calling out the whitewashing of these theories um, and the colonializing of these theories, I guess I would say. And I, I would also um, add that um, sometimes it's hard to, to distinguish like bias in our theories from like just the way we've always done it. Um, you know, those are our core professional values. And I think those are really hard conversations. We, we are starting to have them as Logan says, um, but I, I think that's gonna be a slow and steady thing that we all need to join in and be thinking about those things and, and, and reading those papers, attending those uh, presentations and work together to um, 
to uh, just make sure that we are have an inclusive um, definition of the profession, an inclusive approach to the work that we're doing. So I do want to mention um, Holly earlier uh, mentioned the the institute, the Information Literacy Institute, and I think that's immersion um, she was talking about. Um, and I think it's Holly from Plattsburgh that maybe that Holly, um, because Cerise Oberman, who started, who was a, a librarian at Plattsburgh, started that institute. Um, and so that comes out from ACRL. Hi, Holly. Uh, I guessed right. And Holly's son was my student worker. It's a small world. Oh, wow. So, uh, yes, there are tracks for ACRL immersion that can really put you with a group of people where you learn this stuff together and you start bridging those gaps. Uh, and then our next question from Carrie, uh, are there specific theories that those of us in e-resources and systems should consult um, and begin to understand as a way to develop deeper understanding of how we can enhance our day-to-day -day work? Maybe outside the professional library literature would be a better approach? Yeah, that's not really my area of expertise, clearly. But uh, something that did pop into my mind is the, the critical um, approaches to, um, to uh, the language that we use, you know, things that are going on right now and like how we structure systems and, um, you know, metadata and all that, that to be, uh, so that it has a lot of bias. So, so bias in technology and um, the, uh, racism and subject headings and things like that are, are I, I guess the two areas that that I can think of but I'm not that's not my area of expertise it's not my area of expertise but I know some of our um, administrators in um, access services use a lot of the work with emotional intelligence as far as the day-to-day -day work and uh, you know and a lot of times that's your communications you know, so I'm certainly looking at that literature, but there, sh there should certainly in some of the library literature, there should be some in that aspect of it. Yeah, and I would just say, I would actually start looking at the information behavior uh, literature and see how people solve their problems and then how you can help them solve their problems more quickly. So I, I think about um, GAP, and this is where I'm going to fail as a doc student. I think it was Durbin with the GAP. Mm -hmm. um, good, I'm getting a, a shaking of the head. See, and it's okay <laughs> to not know what have to Google. I will say that. Uh, how, you know, you have to negotiate how you're going to cross that gap, how you're going to get to the other side. And we can come up with ways that make it harder like in Primo where you click available online and it literally jumps you down the record versus tools like LibKey that say download PDF, right? And then it just takes you right to the PDF. I will say University of Buffalo has LibKey and it is my best friend. I would marry it if it were sentient um, because it just takes you right to what you need. And then I see that and go, okay, that's what I need to be doing with my students or I at least need to explain to them how it works um, so that they understand that, yeah, you're gonna click it, but there's just gonna be three clicks and that's just the way it is. We're working on fixing it. Um, but I would say a lot of the information behavior literature that I looked at, especially in the class I took with Amy, was very useful for looking through and saying, this actually, a lot of it can be applied to technical services, cataloging, and from the viewpoint of here are the problems, now let's solve them. Yeah, and Carrie, I hope it helps to think about it like a lens um, to just look at it slightly differently. And, and, you know, I will say with a lot of the, a lot of the theory work that I've done, even though they do write about um, information literacy instruction, I'm still taking it and I still have to work with it and adapt it to my needs. So okay. in our last six minutes, we can jump into any other questions. And feel free to unmute yourself to ask your question. Stop my sharing so I can see all your lovely faces. 
Hi, this is Holly. Um, not Holly from Plattsburgh. <laughs> Holly from CCC again. Um, and I guess I'm I'm wondering. So I'm thinking back to the leisure theories, and to me that seems like a. I guess I'm going I'm going back to this like how are we defining theory, and also how are we sort of placing it as a tool of of mediating a relationship between practice and scholarship versus a component of kind of the scholarly ecosystem. And I guess where I'm coming from is I'm a doc student in history and our first required class is basically going through, um, you know, all, all the different, and I, and to me now it's like, okay, is it theory or is it methodology, right? To say, I'm taking a Marxist approach. I'm, I'm using a Foucauldian approach. And I'm, I'm thinking when the question about language and cataloging came up, to me, I'm like, I think it was in Foucault that I was introduced to this idea of how language becomes this tool of structuring and power. And I guess I'm, I think that the information field <laughs> is constructing sort of its own theories and, and not engaging so much with some of the ones that are, are really used in other fields. And I think there's a strength to that in one sense for information studies, but I also think that it's uh, a gulf that we're creating between ourselves and other fields. So I'm just wondering like what, <laughs> How would we make, how, how are we supposed to make sense of that? And I think defining theory is important so that we're not sort of using different terms imprecisely, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's like a question and then also sort of thought vomit. <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, I think that we do to some extent pull from other disciplines because we are a pretty interdisciplinary field information science. So like Marie Radford drew on communication theory for her work. So, um, so actually the theory then is communication theory, but she created a sort of framework, a structure that is very obviously applicable to practice. Um, so I think we do draw on other disciplines and, uh, but yes, I think it is important. I, I think you would agree with me that it's important for our discipline to come up with our own theories as well. Um, you know, we have a certain perspective that other disciplines don't have. Um, and yeah, important to talk about, to, to know which level of theory we're talking about. But I, I guess it's more important to me that um, practitioners have useful tools for their work. Um, and it's less important to, um, you know, if you're going to write about it or teach it, maybe more important to really know, like, on what level you're talking about. But if you're just trying to find tools for work, you know, I'm not sure that it matters too much where you pull from, whether it's communication or information science or education. I mean, I think we draw from a lot of different different areas, um, uh, social work, um, even I draw things from nursing sometimes, from medicine. So I think that that being interdisciplinary is very useful. Um, and I do think there's maybe some pan practice uh, theories that should be out there. Like I don't see a lot of um, play of venues for different kinds of professionals um, who could who who could share ideas and theory and best practices and things like that. Um, you know, like across teaching, nursing, social work, librarianship. There's there's a lot of um, overlap, and I kind of would like to see more of this sort of um, multi-profession discussion going on, but that doesn't really answer your question, I'm sorry, <laughs> but just a couple of things I thought I would uh, uh, react to. And Holly, I can confirm that between education and information science, it's the same thing, uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with information science is a much younger profession than historians, um, than the profession of history. So it's, I think it is, it's that balance between asserting one's independence as a discipline and having its own language 
and at the expense of not realizing what's happening over here. But the fact that you're a doc student in history can give you some very great insight into a future career of study. Um, and then uh, Rajni posted uh, framework versus theory. And I think you were asking for a definition. And the, a simple way that I think about it is a framework can be composed of multiple theories. So that they're, they're related, but usually when you have a framework, it's sometimes informed by a couple different theories that help you see or help you frame uh, what you're looking at to problem solve. But the, the language is messy. And with that, we are now at time. But I'd like to thank, we should all thank Logan, Carol Ann and Amy for a, a very informative panel. This was, yeah, definitely very informative. I see the hands coming. <laughs> So thank you all again. And just a reminder, uh, at 3.30, there is um, a special interest group uh, functional meetings in room three from 3.30 to 4.15. And then tonight uh, from seven to nine, there's gonna be some fun little activities going on. Uh, feel free to check the schedule for the room number. And with that, um, thank you to our panelists again, and thank you all for attending. <laughs>